So I am coming from Sukuba. This is called a science center of Japan. So it constitutes of 110 research institutes and only we scientists live there. Okay. So during the economic bubble of 1992, Japan created this city dedicated only for research. Uh, in my group, since uh, 2005, I set up my own laboratory and group. Uh, and we work on several topics. Basically, to sum up, you have heard about artificial intelligence, neural network, and several kind of theories which computer scientists propose. We try to implement those principles experimentally in the normal systems. In most of the cases, we do not devise any or propose any new theories. We just try to verify. And in most of the cases, we look for computer scientists to understand. And it's a purely multidisciplinary research. We also talk to biologists how to proceed and how to get inspired. So today, I will talk about uh, microtubule and some computing principles uh, that we can devise from the immediate results of microtubule. To be very honest, in the last four and a half years or five years, I have been working with my groups, uh, several groups on microtubule. We have got remarkable results, series of remarkable results. And to talk about each of them would require one hour each. So I have decided to talk about resonance and wireless communication. This particular topic I will focus in the next 30 minutes. And I will try to convince you that if we take this particular path of resonance, then we can achieve remarkable features that has been only a dream for the computer scientists for the last couple of years. Maybe, as we perceive, it could help in understanding uh, higher level perception, hierarchical argumentation that many of you have argued for the last couple of days to understand consciousness. So outline is quite simple. I will try to see microtubules as a musical device, as a musical string, and try to understand experimentally how this musical device works. And then in the end, I will try to figure out how this simple principle could be used to understand the simple concept computer that can do something that our brain can do, perform, but not existing computers, quantum or classical. So in the beginning, I would start with a simple question that we were discussing during our chat with a medical doctor. And there was some correction from uh, AIMS doctor A.K. Mukhopadhyay. So the question is, how old are you? So if the question is asked, you will start counting your age from the day you were born. But if you look closely, your skin is, skin cells are hardly two weeks old, blood cells, a couple of months, liver cells, around 17 months. Even those organs where it is very difficult to replace cells, like the heart. If you are of the age of 50, 50% 50 of your heart cells are already replaced. So if we consider most of your organs, then we all are of the same age. We are all kuti kuti two and a half year babies. Okay? But there are some cells which are immortal. Those are neurons. I would like to draw your attention to this particular reference published just recently by Magrassi and Rossi. And they, what did they do? Different animals live for different times, right? Some of them lives for 150 years, 180 years. So rat lives for hardly one and a half years, and mouse, three years. So what did they do? They took the neuron out of the rat and put it in the mouse. 33% of the cells survived. 
And those neurons did not die because now you have a good technology. You can put particular fluorescent molecule in the neuron and you can check whether that molecule died or not. So even though that neuron comes from rat and supposed to die around one and a half years or two years, it survived up to three years. That means they concluded, and this is the statement I would like to quote, most people die with most of their neurons intact. If you live to 123, you will die with much more, much of the cells you are born with. Living apart immortals. Now we proceed. Where do we die? So because of protein deposits. One thing we should make sure that particular protein deposits in our brain is different and which increases with the age. So aging research has been increased significantly. I will not get into those topics, but I would like to mention one protein particularly. You can see this protein. This is called prion, and it's a very old protein. Many of us are aware about it, but recently it is again in the news. So this is a Nobel Prize winning work. And the protein, this, is, this protein, all of your brain cells, every one of you who are sitting here, we have this protein in our brain. But may God be merciful. If it conformal, conformation changes from here to here, it becomes so infectious that it will kill you within six to seven months. And how will it kill you? Slowly and slowly, it will destroy your consciousness. You will not be able to understand what are you up to, what has happened to you after a couple of months. All organs working fine. Everything is working fine. Slowly and slowly your consciousness will disappear. With this, I would like to enter into my talk. So, protein-protein interactions. This is a remarkable network of protein-protein interactions of 5,000 proteins in our body. So they are highly interconnected. And if you try to understand what is the connection between them, it is very difficult because I coined a phrase in 2008, one to many and many to one at a time. This is the basic principle of our neural network. And this is the basic principle of ionic network in our body. And this is the basic principle of the neurons operating and the proteins operating and every single system in our body. So if you try to analyze this and ask any computer scientist to do this, and find out every single path. I can calculate and I can demonstrate. Of course, any mathematical uh, science expert or computer science expert can tell you that if you want to understand all the dynamics of these proteins using finite computers or classical or quantum, whatever it may be, you cannot scale it down in a finite time. It's so big. So there are circuits in our body ionic circuits which operate synchronously and asynchronously, continuously to run our body. So throughout the body, from the bottom of our leg to head of us to the head, every part starting from ion diffusion to proteins to holding our operation, everywhere you will find exposition of particular principle, one to many, many to one at a time. So today, we will try to understand how we can underpin this one-to-many, many-to-one network. So the physical physics principle that I will use is resonance. So let me explain what is resonance. Suppose you give an input pulse like this and a continuous stream of this, a particular frequency and particular amplitude, to any particular device, and it has a self uh, oscillation frequency, similar and amplitude, then you will get a huge output. So the, there will be a non-radiative, that means lossless energy transfer between the two objects, and you will see a huge uh, uh, increase in the energy in the oscillation. So the object will start oscillating violently. So you can do wireless power transfer and wireless communication. And two terms are important in my talk. One is synchrony and another is desynchrony. What is that? If there are 
pair of electrodes, say one pair of electrode is this, another pair of electrode is this, another pair of electrode is this, then if you have a signal one, two, three, if they come at the same time, then we say that it is synchronous. And if they do not appear at the same time, then we call it desynchrony has occurred. Okay? So these two are the basic concept that I will be using in my talk today. Uh, for the last four and a half years, we have been trying to see microtubules with a scanning tunneling microscope. Scanning tunneling microscope is a machine by which you get quantum tunnel uh, of current and you can measure atomic scale what is happening directly and experimentally. So after nearly four years, we succeeded in measuring single tubulin protein and single microtubule. What very remarkable about this particular material is that when we were measuring single tubulin protein, conductivity is very less and microtubule even though single tubulin protein is 4 nanometer wide and microtubule is 25 nanometer, it's a huge structure. Still, microtubule nanoware is 3,000 times more conducting than a single tubulin protein. So, let us summarize what happened actually in the year 2008 when we started microtubule research. We started from here, bottom. You know the Hindu story of uh, blind persons trying to understand how elephant looks like. So that is the background picture. And we started finding out several properties like ferroelectricity, automated noise alleviation, entropy engine, condensation of vibration levels, drug modulation, piezoelectric behavior, one after another. But we could not underpin where actually at the atomic scale things are happening because we are not able to image for a long, long time and directly give proof. So last October, I went into the laboratory with my postdoctoral fellow that let's get this done. It is enough and enough. So October, November, December, I was completely in the lab time to time and I, I extracted this particular information. So today, for the first time, I will show you a protein and how its potential fluctuates. I don't think any group ever uh, managed to capture this. So this is the last point where we reached after all these di discussions. So if you want to hear any of these uh, discoveries and research, then please follow up my previous talks. And today, I will concentrate only on a few topics, especially focusing on resonance. So please do not consider this is the only remarkable thing that uh, is there. So I will just concentrate here. So after looking at single tubulin protein, we went on, we have an atomic tip. So single atom we can control. With the development of nanotechnology, it is possible to use single atomic tip and measure how atoms behave and atomic structures behave. So we, uh, we measured single tubulin protein and we took out the water molecule, water channel from the microtubule. So inside microtubule, inside the protein, there is a water channel. If you take out slowly and slowly, this is what happens actually. And if you switch microtubule to store information, if you look at the image, you can see this is a higher contrast and lower contrast region. So this is dipole is directed here. And higher contrast region here, lower contrast region here. Dipole is directed here. So dipolar switching, we could really actually image. Okay? So this is not a theory or imagination or anything comes out of perception or something. This is really imaged with our machine. Uh, Next, we will try to understand how microtubule vibrates and what is their communication of different vibrational levels. Let us first see what we are talking about uh, water channel and proteins. 
to have a small video. So, uh, these are the proteins and this is the water channel we are talking about. And as far as resonance is concerned, we found the outer wave ionic or maybe for other reason, we get kilohertz resonance, kilohertz frequency, megahertz resonance comes due to the protein channels and water channels, we get gigahertz resonance. This is not again a theoretical perception, we could take out each and every material and we can measure directly. So, we can measure, not only measure single tubulin protein, we can measure with and without water channel the microtubules and we can underpin why we are getting the resonance. And this is the summary. So, in kilohertz, we have couple of frequencies, megahertz, there are lots of different frequencies and gigahertz, there are two particular resonance bands and they, like any musical device, it modulates phase pi by 4 and, uh, and di for different resonance frequencies, different phase is associated, okay. So, that is important. So, if we, if we scan a large number of microtubules, for the last four years, we have studied more than hundreds of devices and I have not made a video of this, but if you think this after this after this after this, you can imagine that it is playing just like a piano. This is what we call a music. So, the microtubule is changing its frequency and resonance frequencies. Total energy is same. It is non-linearly distributed among different channels. You can write a particular resonance uh, state and raise it. And this is the behavior we are talking about. And coherence time is around 100 microseconds. And quality factor, which is very essential for wireless energy transport or wireless communication, is how sharp is the peak, that is quality factor roughly. And that is, that varies on which frequency you are operating. Now, wireless communication among two microtubules. I don't know from the back you can see it or not, but here we have one microtubule and here we have the second microtubule. We pump the resonance signal here and measure it here. There is a gap and we could close it. And we found that if we pump here, we can get signal here and we can pump here to get signal in the other. Even if we block with metals, it doesn't stop. If we put solution, buffer solution in, in this, the signal enhances dramatically. So, there exists an wireless communication between two microtubules. This is a TAM image. I don't have the video right now. Uh, and it oscillates between the two. So, it's me uh, mechanical also. Motion is associated with it. And MT1 pumped MT1 output. MT2 pumped MT2 output. MT1 pumped MT2 output. So, this is the signal that wirelessly transmitted from one microtubule to another. So, this is the first direct experimental evidence that if you keep two microtubules far apart, no connection in between, even if you try to block the communication occurs. Now, I will show you the result that I was always talking in the beginning, from the beginning. So, with STM tip, we cut the tubule in half into pieces, alpha or beta. And look at this image. This is the first image of a protein. This is live image and this is potential fluctuation, no theoretical data. Okay? So, you will see that potential is fluctuating between different regions and we can get eight different lobes. And when we have two of these connected to each other, that is alpha and beta that makes a dimer which constitutes the microtubule. And then you see it's a symmetrically changes these lobes, eight lobes disappear. So, they be behave as if coherently and it fluctuates between the two. That means a coherence a communication between the two exists at the atomic scale. Okay? So, 
this tells us about the quantum processing that is going on. We have not underpinned it. We are not the theoretician. I mean, theoreticians can find out explanation, but this is a direct experimental evidence that uh, there exists a absolute coherent communication at the atomic scale in single tubulin protein and in this dimer. And you can see a very interesting thing. In some of the video images, you will find that energy is localized at this, at this junction. And this is propagated out as a soliton. So today I will not discuss about this, but uh, we, this particular image or video explains many unexplained things that we observe in a later scale. So uh, when we get any result, even though we are not theoretician, we try to get an explanation, a simple explanation, so that we can understand what is happening over there. So we thought that protein, there are uh, spring-like channels, right? So let us consider that as inductors. There are redox group, let us consider capacitors. And if beta sheets are there, it's a dumping of oscillation, so let's consider it gram. So we construct a circuit, uh, a resonant, resonant circuit, which we study in our textbook in the school days. Okay? So simp very simply that, and try to model the resonance frequencies, and it, we got very consistent data, and we could explain uh, the resonance peaks. And from that, uh, this is particular concept. So, so what we uh, conceptualized is something that when energy comes and falls into these strings, okay, so uh, this is a different video. This is transmission across microtubules, but inside the tubulin protein, it oscillates within the alpha helix. And then after that, it goes outside, and it moves toward the microtubule. These are the phonon solitons. We imaged it earlier. I will not get into details. These are the images. I will skip this, because these are the live images using HTM and AFM, the wireless information transport across microtubule. Uh, this is a soliton engine, I will skip. Just before I finish, we also studied uh, different kind of drug molecules uh, and created microtubules along with, and we found the synchronous frequency for plant tubulins are at a very lower range. This is where animals, and this is where fungi and others. And if it's a cancer cell, cancer tubulins from cancer cell, there is, I mean, for all frequencies, they get synchrony. So this was a very interesting result, and we, we were so happy with seeing this, because this tells you that tubulin, we all species got separated, all the trees, the plants, and animals, whatever you are seeing, we got separated billions of years before. But this was programmed even before that. So there is no overlap. We share the frequency space. And we studied a large number of uh, drug molecules to find out whether data is consistent or not. So with that part, I finish my first half of my talk. In the next couple of minutes, I will try to argue how this could be used for information processing. So <clears throat> if uh, you are all aware that people are trying to make robot and instantaneous decisions in complexity scenarios, Okay. Complexity scenario, what is uh, complexity scenario? Every year, we create 10 to the power 20 bits of information, and it is exchanged all over the world. So a whole, whole world full of information we create every year. And parameters are entangled in such a way, if there is a single chaos, that can collapse the entire system of the world. So we need to find it out. And that's why 15 groups across the globe have invested billions of dollars to devise a computer so that we can get instantaneous solution to the complexity problem. Now, what is this? Why quantum and computing existing protocols? I'm not saying that uh, change, by changing protocol it will not be possible, but existing protocols fail to make instant decisions to unknown problems. Because algorithms need to be written, circuits need to be constructed. Algorithms and circuits remain a liability for the smartest neural network. Okay? 
And existing computing protocols cannot alleviate the necessity of algorithms and circuit because computing for a hardware circuit means questioner should reach individual option holder to retrieve the answer. What is this? Suppose one of you have got a ball and I am asked classically to find out who has got the ball. So if I am doing it classically, what I would do, I would go to everybody and ask, have you got the ball? And answer should be no. And then if the last one has got a ball, I have to ask, how many questions? Total number of people present in this room. Say, there are 16 people and one of them has got the ball. Now, you have to ask, go and ask everybody in a classical computing protocol. Now, let's go to Grover's algorithm. I think uh, previous speaker talked about this. Grover's algorithm, if you see, this is a very complicated quantum mechanical things. But you scale it down very simply. What is this? Uh, can't we simple people uh, understand this? Okay, I will make you understand. What is Grover's algorithm? Uh, what you do is 16 people are there, and you need to understand who has got the ball. You first divide into eight and eight, two groups. The eight one, you make the first query. Quantum mechanics allows you to entangle all of them, and you can ask one question and can get answer whether they have got the ball or not. So with one question, you, you confirm that none of them have it. Then you take the rest four, rest eight and four group. Second query, you come to know that they don't have it. Then third query, they don't have it. Fourth query, he doesn't have it. So this person has got it. So as maximum, you need four queries. So this is called log n advantage. So if there are 2 to the power 64 options, if you can uh, entangle and apply this protocol, you can get it. But always please remember that always you cannot apply this. This is for very particular kind of factorization or other kind of problem. Whenever you need to break the entanglement and need to run, write a new algorithm and change the algorithm, change the situation, then you need to break the algorithm, entanglement. Then your time profit that you are getting through quantum is not possible. It is impossible. So there are, in the last three, four years, there are several papers which are arguing. I'm surprised nobody is listening to those papers. There are several arguments that very particular cases you can get advantage by going to the quantum. Always you need to write algorithm and you need to make a circuit. Both are the liabilities. Now let's come to this thought. And this is the thought that uh, I want to share with you and this is the only message that I have to give today. Suppose 16 people are around and I put an antenna on all of them and I ask the question, the person who has the ball can reply me back. If he can reply me back for 16 persons, how many questions I need to ask? How many? Just one. For 100 people, how many questions I need to ask? Just one. For 1 million persons, how many questions I need to ask? Just one. So why do I go for quantum protocols existing and um, classical algorithm? Why can't I design a device that has an antenna who can reply me back? Then, why classically circuit is built? You know crossbar architecture is a circuit in your all small chips. So you need to address every single switch in the chip. There are millions and millions of switches and every switch we need to know. People are crazy about it. Moore's law is there. So every, everywhere wearing is needed. But what if I don't need any wearing? Then if the switch can send the answer back to the questionnaire, one centimeter square of Pentium 4 processor has 20 kilometers of wearing. So heat problem and many other problems are there. So I will go for this. Let's see. So these are microtubules. I put two probes here, and these are the resonance peaks. There are many resonance peaks, but we choose, have chosen 64 of them. We send, we wrote with two probes a particular 
answer. That is this kind of resonance peaks here. And when we pump it, it goes resonance and here we find that at this position, these peaks are intensity are so high that these are submerged. So I get that answer back. So if you give me 100 microtubules, 1000 microtubules, 1 million microtubules, billions of microtubules, I can pump only once and tell you whether you have written there or not. I'm not saying I can solve all the problems of the world, but for certain problems, certain fine and particular kind of metric such problem, I can do it instantly. Not as fast as quantum, of course, but I'm not talking about speed. I'm talking about to go for an algorithm to understand consciousness or intelligence or some behavior that is particularly found in the human being. Instantaneous solution. Before I give this lecture, none of you here or had a feeling what I'm going to talk about, right? You came here without writing algorithm, what Anirban is going to tell. But you came here, you processed all my words instantly in your brain, you analyzed it, you, 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 you decided this is uh, uh, not acceptable, this is acceptable, that could be, that could be, and many, many things you did. And at the same time, you were thinking about your home, about the next trip to Taj, and many, 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 many things. And all are being processed without writing any single algorithm. So unless until we devise a computing protocol that allows us, enables us to understand how to do it without writing algorithm and without writing circuits with certain materials, we cannot go move towards it. Just think, just one example I would like to give. NASA sent a probe to Mars, and they found that it is a 0.5 angle deviated. So when the signal came to NASA, NASA sent uh, back instruction correcting it. The first mission to move to that page. By the time signal had reached there, it lost. Okay? It got destroyed because it entered into the atmosphere with a, with a different angle. Had the robot got the ability to make a decision making with instantaneous analysis of the situations, then could, we are not talking about creating human being or another another conscious device, but at least whatever the human basic characteristics are there, at least we should be there, the, at least to start what consciousness is all about. Next thing, so first thing I would say, I say is reply back. I'm sorry, this will be the last one. Another thing we need to add, because uh, uh, we need, if we have decision between zero and one, we cannot do complex programming and complex information processing. There is a little bit of problem. I will not discuss about it, but I will tell you very simply what additional concept you need to take today. That is uh, time, space and time operation. So instead of one, zero, one, you have to take zero, one, zero, one, two, zero, one, two, three, and also time variation with it. So how it is? So if you try to synchronize one peak with another peak, what happens? You get some, you get some delay, okay? So synchronization time changes with intensity, frequency, coupling factor, and quantity factor somehow. So if you have a 2D matrix, matrix means these peaks, okay? So let me tell you that any information of the world could be converted in terms of a surface pattern, okay? Any information. So with 2D matrix, we can, basically convert into any m cross a, any dimension. You were talking about uh, um, 10 to the power 15 dimension. Vedas talk about multiple dimensions, whatever it is. Whatever be the dimension, it could be converted into a Turi m cross n dimensional matrix. It has been mathematically shown and proved. So, so it comes to this matrix and then we have time. Time has not. And those who uh, are strong arguer for quantum consciousness, quantum information processing, I would like to request you to look at here. This, of course, at the certain level you need quantum. Without quantum you cannot go. I agree with Jack and several others. But there are not everything everywhere you will apply quantum blindly. Just see this. Here you, you get time, so you get a space-time 3D curvature. Now, if you have quantum entanglement there, then you have faster than light all of it. 
you cannot play with time. You cannot get another dimension and increase the robustness of your information process. So let me give you one example. Uh, uh, hmm. So this is the 64 peaks. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. You can count up to 64, right? So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 19, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. In this way, you can go to 64. So I'm talking about 2D matrix means these are the 64 peaks. Okay? Clear? Now this could be could be represented, this box, as a circle. Okay? Now think. You see an apple, and this is with a microtubule 1 resonance peak, and it is common. And it goes, the common region, it triggers another microtubule that has contained information when you, when you were a childhood, your father gave you that apple. And that it triggers that in that picnic, you played chess game. And that triggers another microtubule which contains the information, even at a very distance correlation is unravel, further chess mess, smile appears. So here, brother created a mess. And then, with the other brother, mother smiled. Now mother smiled is written at this microtubule, it comes back and it tells you what happened on that day. And not only this way, you can, you can devise complicated arguments later on. So you can start with the input matrix and it can go higher, higher, higher order matrix you can trigger. And this with this fractal like, whatever you want to do, you can trigger. So information unit is a space time transfer. And simply by changing the coupling factor, you can create enormous complex spaces around it. Just to view you, uh, this, is, um, this is little technical. This is called basin of attractor. But just I want to um, give you a little look if someone specialist is here. So, so each are pattern. Okay? Patterns are coupled with different of them. But you don't need to store them. When you are storing the information itself, the coupling is automatically takes place. So it's a in astronomically large space in which if they are there, when you are asking if the corresponding process is creating out, giving out then, right? So you don't have to. Let me give you another example. Suppose you want to store A. A will be stored, say, in four microtubules, this um, four or five microtubules, this space. But you can trigger a few uh, uh, resonance levels, and you can get back this. Level two, you can trigger this, and you can get back this. Level three, this, higher level this. So you can look at an ice cream. I can do this higher level perception process here. And you can, those ice cream looks like this, and if, if you perceive a tree, so at a higher level, it, it, it links up with another, another, another uh, matrix, and you, you perceive that you are looking at a tree. So you, you can get higher level perception, which is a very complicated task for computer scientists. And 2D shape, if you want to do it, triangle, you can do like this. Faster synchrony and the delayed synchrony, you can put 3D. And you can do many things. Now let us summarize. OK? So this is a Turing machine. If you don't know, in 1937, there was a proposal that on a piece of tape, you can write, convert any information of the world, whatever it is. Uh, uh, say, considering just Turing hypothesis, OK, together. Now, uh, this person sitting here is creating it. Now, the problem of intractability, when it comes on, then you need a supplier. Uh, there are two deep kind of problem in intractable computing problems, so when, you, when you need large space or large time. So I'm taking large space. So supply the tape, and somebody has to roll it back, because you need infinite space. This is called resource problem. You can refer to Josta and Rep's paper to understand what is there. So this is horizontal. But in quantum, you need entanglement of. So it is vertical, not horizontal. It is vertical. So vertically, you need two gods, because uh, these guys don't have any work. So they are sitting and uh, praying. And uh, so one has to give uh, this uh, infinite space Two gods are busy in that. Another god is giving entanglement of in infinite space that you need. Okay, so three gods required. So just to give you a simple idea of what, where we are trying to differ. But uh, in case of sequential and simultaneous part, in our case, what we are saying, we just cut the pieces of a large string 
to exactly find out where it is located because we have the concept of reply back. So we don't need to harness entire resource. So we cut it back and then we need, of course, we need a little bit of quantum feature that is simultaneity we need. Otherwise we can't do because there are several processes being made absolute currently. But this, is, this gives you a very simple idea of how we are trying to differ by this replying back concept. So it is zero and one. Quantum is zero and one. Now you can devise this concept that I'm, I'm, I propose today, either quantum mechanically or classically, what, whatever suits you, but we need to test. So zero and one, it could be different probability values, but they are coupled and exist simultaneously. So you get much more solutions along with time to follow this particular protocol. But here you can have locally, you can have quantum. I'm not arguing. But what I'm saying, the principle of replying back and operating with time tensions is essential. So in conclusion, marketable holds the potential for wireless communication and computing that requires two simple changes. Reply back, instead of bits or qubits, we use 3D space time tension. But could enable us realizing circuitless, softwareless, instantaneous decision making just like a human brain. Not everything, but a tiny little bit of it. But I believe a tiny little bit of it in this direction is an achievement that could take us to a far, far away. At least towards understanding consciousness is all about scientifically. Thank you. Thank you very much. A very absorbing talk. We have time for a couple of questions from the audience. So uh, let's say you have a microtubule in uh, one neuron and a microtubule in another, or in the same neuron or maybe different neurons. And uh, they have, let's say one is at one megahertz and the other one is synchro almost synchronized at 1.0001 megahertz. Would you have a beat frequency? Uh, shall we have? Would you have a beat frequency? Uh, that I, I, I don't know. Okay. Because um, we have tested, um, we, we are now creating an experimental setup in which we will study uh, two single microtubules, uh, two single neurons far apart. But uh, as far as physics theory is concerned, you are, I have to say uh, yes to your answer. Okay. Because definitely there will be a bit frequency. Um, Do you need entanglement for that or, or you don't want entanglement? Uh, there are several features, as I said, that we don't have any explanation. Now what are we are doing? We are reproducing our data as much as possible and uh, we are seeing it, but explanations we don't have. So whether these are happening classically or these are happening due to quantum entanglement, that needs to be uh, studied uh, future, in future. 